would un... December 26, 1996. A perfect Christmas had just passed, but little did the Ramsey family know their world was about to shatter into a thousand chilling pieces. This is the story of John Bonet Ramsey, a vivacious six-year-old beauty queen and symbol of innocence, whose life was tragically cut short. She was not just a victim, she was the victim, and her connection to the killer is a mystery that has baffled the world for years. Stay with us until the end, because what you're about to discover will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew about this case. This story takes us to the quiet city of Boulder, Colorado, situated beneath the majestic Rocky Mountains. Boulder was famous for its serene streets and friendly neighborhoods. John Bonet Ramsey was a bubbly six-year-old girl with an infectious smile that could brighten the gloomiest day. John Bonet had a passion for beauty pageants, and she shone like a star under the spotlight. Her vibrant personality and charm could win over anyone she met. But what happened to her on that fateful night in Boulder would send shockwaves through this close-knit community, leaving a trail of unanswered questions and deepening mysteries. The family woke up at 5.30 a.m. on December 26th to board a private flight for their second residence in Michigan. When Patsy, John Bonet's mother, went to prepare breakfast for the family, she found a ransom note addressed to her husband, John. The Ramseys were told not to call the police and that they would be contacted between 8 and 10 a.m. that morning. But Patsy still called Kimberly Archuleta, the 911 dispatcher, at 5.52 in the morning. After gathering the crime's specifics, Archuleta sent police to the family's 15th Street home, where they resided with their son Burke, age 9, and John Bonet. The police arrived at the Ramsey house, but because it was Christmas and the more senior policemen were at home, the case was attended by less experienced cops. The Ramseys contacted their friends, the Whites, in the interim to ask for assistance in finding their daughter. They came soon after the cops and were given access to the residence. At around 7.30 a.m., John left the living room to secure the ransom amount for the kidnappers. In order to prevent further contamination, the police locked down John Bonet's bedroom at 10 a.m. Around the same time, the FBI showed up to wiretap the Ramsey's phone. The period of time during which the kidnappers had said they were going to call passed, and the FBI left but they left the Ramseys with another officer. The Boulder Police Department's Detective Linda Arndt advised John to keep himself occupied by looking around the house. To everyone's shock, John and Fleet White eventually found John Bonet in the basement just after 1 p.m. She was covered in a blanket, had her mouth taped shut, and had a garrote fastened around her neck using a paintbrush as leverage. Six-year-old John Bonet was dead. There were two distinct sets of footprints found near the body. However, none were to be found outside the house where snow was piled up. She was laid on the floor after John brought her body upstairs. She remained on a sofa after the cops carried her body there until the coroner picked her up around eight o'clock that evening. The coroner determined that ligature strangulation and craniocerebral damage caused John Bonet's death. She was struck in the head with an unknown object and strangled. Although the murder weapon was never located, other items have come under consideration. A metal baseball bat was later located during the search close to the butler door, but it's likely that one of the property's staff members may have placed it there. However, it was discovered that the bat had carpet strands from the basement. The kitchen counter mounted torch, whose head matched the design of the wound discovered on John Bonet's head, was another object in doubt. In addition to this, she had numerous cuts on her legs, neck, cheek, and other body areas. It was also pointed out that John Bonet's underwear was stained with blood, which suggested that she had been subjected to sexual abuse. These findings sent a wave of shock and grief throughout the community. The gruesome discovery marked the beginning of a complex and highly publicized investigation that would unfold over the coming weeks and years. As the investigation began, the Boulder Police Department focused their attention on the Ramseys family, including John Bonet's parents and her older brother. Suspicion arose due to factors such as the ransom note found in the house. The note was bizarrely lengthy, 
and written on a notepad from the Ramsey's home. It demanded $118,000 for John Bonet's safe return, an amount that coincidentally matched John Ramsey's work bonus. Jim Fitzgerald, a forensic linguist who examined the note and developed a profile of the author, brought attention to some intriguing features. Despite being authored by a small foreign faction, the letter had excellent writing. Because several challenging words were correctly spelt, he deduced that the author was English speaking. Because the note lacked any slang, he also assumed that the author was older than 30. Additionally, he concluded that the author was a woman. He cited phrases like, when you get home, and do not particularly like you, as two examples of six instances of maternalistic language in the note. And coincidentally, the Christmas newsletter from Ramsey utilized a lot of similar words. These findings hinted towards the idea that this ransom note was a fake. Another interesting detail was that simple words like possession were misspelled while other difficult words were correctly spelled. This further emphasizes the idea of a fake. The discovery of DNA evidence at the crime scene added complexity to the case. DNA samples did not match any members of the Ramsey family, leading investigators to consider the possibility of an intruder. The intruder theory gained traction, suggesting that an unknown assailant had entered the Ramsey home, committed the murder, and fled undetected. Despite this theory, skepticism persisted. Some believed that the Ramsey family might be involved in the crime, either directly or through a cover-up. Questions were raised about the ransom note's content, its length, and the specific amount of money demanded, which matched John Ramsey's work bonus. The case took a dramatic turn in June 1998, when a grand jury was convened to investigate further. However, despite months of deliberation, the grand jury did not return any indictments, and the case remained unsolved. The investigation continued to generate public interest, with numerous books, documentaries, and theories exploring the mystery. Ultimately, in July 2008, District Attorney Mary Lacey officially cleared the Ramsey family of any involvement in John Bonet's death, citing newly discovered DNA evidence that did not match any family members. Another suspect was Bill McReynolds, whose wife, Janet McReynolds, had written a play titled Hey Ruby, which was being performed at a local theater around the time of John Bonet Ramsey's murder. This play featured a storyline involving child abuse and a violent death. Since there was a faint similarity, some investigators briefly considered whether there might be an actual connection between the themes of the play and the murder of John Bonet Ramsey. Ultimately, neither Bill nor Janet McReynolds were implicated in John Bonet Ramsey's murder, and the investigation moved in other directions. Gary Oliva, a convicted sex offender, gained notoriety in the early 2000s when he claimed responsibility for John Bonet Ramsey's murder in letters he composed while in prison. Oliva had a history of criminal activity, and his confessions were marked by disturbing fantasies and expressions of guilt. Despite his shocking claims, Oliva's confessions lacked any credible evidence to support their authenticity. Investigators regarded his statements with skepticism, as it became evident that he did not possess direct knowledge of the crime. John Mark Carr, a former school teacher, also thrust himself into the spotlight of this case in August 2006 with a sensational confession. He claimed responsibility for the murder, providing graphic and chilling details about the crime. His bizarre behavior and claims captivated media attention worldwide, turning him into a prominent figure in the case. However, his credibility quickly eroded as investigators discovered stark inconsistencies between his confession and established facts. DNA evidence conclusively ruled him out as a suspect, and the true reasons behind his false confession remained a mystery. You must have noticed that DNA samples played a crucial part in this case. However, these samples have a questionable reliability. On the morning of John Bonet's disappearance, relatively new policemen from the force arrived at the residence. When the Whites showed up to assist with the search, they were allowed into the house without delay, disregarding the contamination of the scene after the officers had spent four hours sealing off John Bonet's bedroom. 
Friends and a victim's advocacy group occupied themselves with cleaning and organizing the home while also destroying any evidence that would have been helpful to the police. John Bonet's wrist cuffs and the tape covering her mouth had already been taken off when she was brought up from the cellar by John Ramsey. Before the medical examiner and forensics arrived, an officer had already moved John Bonet's body twice from the ground to a sofa. Now the biggest shocker, these samples are now considered fallacious. Dr. Henry Lee, a forensic expert, evaluated a set of store-bought pants and the results showed that DNA trace evidence was there. This demonstrated that the DNA detected on John Bonet's pants may have originated during the manufacturing process. This means that the most important piece of evidence was compromised from the beginning. As we have covered, there were a number of suspects, DNA samples, and numerous leads originating from more than 21,000 tips, letters, and emails. According to authorities, police have traveled to 19 states to interview or speak with more than 1,000 individuals. Yet, as of the present day, John Bonet Ramsey's murder remains unsolved, making it one of the most enduring mysteries in American criminal history. The case continues to fascinate and perplex the public, with theories and speculation persisting, and John Bonet's tragic death serving as a symbol of unresolved justice. The legacy of John Bonet Ramsey lives on, not just in the hearts of those who remember her, but in the countless documentaries, books, and true crime discussions that continue to this day. As we conclude our journey into this enigmatic tragedy, we're left with more questions than answers. Who really killed John Bonet Ramsey? Was it a family member, an intruder, or someone else entirely? The truth remains hidden, locked away in the chilling silence of that fateful night. If you have any thoughts or theories, please share them in the comments below.